the following message was given by Swami Ramdas to the devotees of Silo at the conclusion of his tour of this country on the eve of his return to India. The glory of the divine name. Beloved devotees, Ramdas's parting message to you is the message of the divine name. Guru and the name which the Guru gave were the two great saviors that liberated Ramdas from the bondage of ignorance and granted him perfect bliss and peace. He who has always God's name on his lips is a blessed soul. God's name is sweeter than nectar. If you keep it in your tongue always, you will be drinking the sweetness of it and that sweetness will enter into every part of your being and make you intoxicated with the divine emotions of peace and bliss. Ramdas can tell you from his personal experience that as far as he was concerned, he found that there was no easier, greater, purer and more efficacious sadhana for attaining God than the repetition or chanting of his glorious name. This is definite. It is not his experience alone, but the experience of all the sages and saints of India and the world. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna has said that of all the yajnas, he is the Japa Yajna, which is therefore the highest. In this Kali Yuga, there is no other way for salvation than the repetition of Hari's name. That is the only saviour, and he who takes the name is sure of salvation, not at a distant date, but in another, now or in another birth, but in this birth and at this very moment. It is said that the divine name is not tasting sweet to so many. When Ramdas was drinking the sweetness of the name, friends used to come to him. Ramdas glorified the name before them, telling them that the name was very, very sweet. But the friends said, the sweetness may be for you, not for us. We, we repeat the same name, but do not derive as much peace and happiness as you. What is the reason? How can we find a taste for ourselves also? What is the defect in us? What is the remedy? Ramda said to answer them in the words of a great saint who has composed a song on the subject. The purpose of the song is the moment your head touches the dust of a saint's feet all your desires for the objects of the senses will disappear and then only when you repeat God's name it will taste sweet to you. And as you go on repeating the name, the joy proceeding from it goes on increasing until it fills you through and through and you see God in your own heart, your eyes shed tears of joy and your heart wells up with love for all beings. This is the process by which we can really taste the sweetness of the name of God and realize God within our own hearts. You know that when a man is stricken with a certain kind of fever, if you give him sugar, he finds it bitter and throws it away. But when he is free from fever, the same sugar tastes sweet. So too, we have a disease in the mind that is called vasana, clinging to the objects of the senses, desires for the pancha vishaya, the found kinds of objects which the senses crave for. These must go, so long as these sense desires are deep-rooted in our mind, the name does not taste sweet. Therefore, what we have to do is, 
at the very first time when our mind seeks to find God or is in search of God, we must contact a saint, touch his feet and accept him as our spiritual guide and then receive the name from him. Thereafter, you will see the marvelous effect the repetition produces in you. Your whole being will be flooded with bliss and peace. Your heart will be filled with love for all beings in the world. Your eyes will see God everywhere. The name will free you from bondage, will give you peace and harmony in the place of discord and disharmony. It will grant you light and dispel darkness. It will grant you immortality by conquest over death. Such is the glory of the divine name. You know we are seized by ten evils. As Lord Buddha says, there are three of the mind, four of the tongue and three of the body. Unless these ten evils are eradicated, we cannot be absolutely pure and unless we are absolutely pure, we cannot see God, we cannot have His vision and realization. The three evils of the mind are envy, hatred and skepticism. Four of the tongue are slandering, abusing, gossiping and lying. Three evils of the body are stealing, killing and adultery. These ten evils are of thought, word and deed. In order to free ourselves from these evils, what are we to do? We can take these ten evils to be the ten heads of the Ravana who is within us, who is the Abhiman or ego sense. Who killed this ten-headed monster? You know very well that Rama did it. So in order to destroy these ten evils in us, to destroy the ten-headed demon in us, Ram Nam is the way. He who repeats Ram Nam constantly, you may depend upon it, would not have to destroy this evils one by one. His name lays the axe at the very root of all the evils and makes us absolutely pure. It frees us from every evil until our ego sense also vanishes. Then we realize God within us, God without us and God everywhere about us. The whole universe will thereafter stand transformed before us as the very image of God. To this height of realization, the divine name takes us. If we repeat the name after having contacted a saint and touched the dust of his feet, then it is we shall see that what glorious power this name has, what a great influence it wields on us for our uplift, for the ultimate realization of our real self, which is the same as God. So name is a precious jewel which we should not lose when we have once gained it. If we take to it, we must do so with all our heart, with all love and faith in its power. Sages and saints are never tired of singing the glories of the name. You may find this out for yourself. Sit still and sing the name and get your mind inebriated with its sweetness. You will find your whole body is permeated with a strange ecstasy in which you will find your ego sense of low desires disappear completely and you are thoroughly purified. If you continue doing this practice, you will be established in that state. You will become the very image of God. No other sadhana can take you to this spiritual height. Other sadhanas may raise you to self-realization, but they cannot infuse into you that joy of the self permeating your entire being, entering not only your mind and intellect, but also in all your emotions, senses and body. Nay, every atom of your physical frame will be thrilling with joy. 
That is why the saints approach God by taking His name, His sweet and glorious name, constantly. If you have it on your tongue continuously, you will be enjoying the sweetness of the name without break. Just as you get sweetness continuously when you keep a nectarine pill on your tongue, such is the sweetness of the name. Saints and devotees go to the length of saying, O oh God, I do not want you, but I want your name. I am perfectly satisfied with the sweetness of your name. The name is so blissful that they, they do not want even the vision of God, but they are happy in having the name. They say, from life to life I would wish to be born in order to repeat your name. Moksha is not a thing to be attained. It is there already with us. But the sweetness of communion with God through the repetition of His name is a rare acquisition. As Atman, we are always free. We were never born and we never die. And there is no such thing as liberating the Atman. The soul is ever free. Only we have to know and realize this. When you realize it, it is done. The sweetness you get from the name is a different thing. By the mere knowledge of the self, you are not so happy as when you repeat the name of God, of that supreme reality within you. The name brings out the divine sweetness to the surface, on to the plane of the body, the senses and the mind, and sweetens your entire life. That is why the name has been held as the highest thing in the world. Ramdasa's one task, wherever he went, was to glorify the name and they would tell everybody to take the name, the name of two syllables, Rama, Krishna, Shiva, or any name one liked. So Ramdasa's parting message to you is that you should take to the repetition of God's name, see the power it wields on you how it elevates you, illumines you, and fills you with the divine peace and joy. It is not enough to praise the name by singing songs about the name. You must act according to the teachings of the great saints who have told us that it is not enough if you simply sing the glories of the name. We should attempt to keep the name constantly on our lips while walking, sitting, and doing any physical work. Gradually you will find the name takes possession of you. It's not that we take possession of the name, but the name takes possession of us. Then you will see how your mind refuses to wander here and there. It gets absorbed in the name and derives immense peace and joy. Contact of the name is contact of God, because name and God are not different. Name is God and God is name. You will know it when you are repeating it because name gives you unending peace and joy, immortal peace and bliss. That is the power of the name. So you will never give it up once you take it up. The mind will then never run after the illusory pleasures of the senses like a thirsty person running to drink water from the mirage. We are after the objects of the senses for pleasure. You will find by experience that there is no real joy in them. Real peace and bliss is within us and we can have direct experience of this. The name makes God manifest in all our activities. Ramdas has been here in Islam for more than three weeks taken from place to place all over Ceylon. He has met thousands of friends and talked to them about jnana, bhakti, universal love and service, unity of all religions, etc. But his prime object, the burden of his song as it was, was to spread the message of the name everywhere, and that has been done. That is his favorite subject, the glory of the name that was given to him by his compassionate and all-merciful Guru. So, have the name of God always on your lips.
there is no evil outside you. In reality, there is no evil at all. The external enemies, so-called, the evil you see outside, are in fact projections from your own mind. On the face of it, this may seem to you to be not only an astounding proposition, but also a very hard one to accept. Still, that is the truth. Nobody is conspiring against you except the uncontrolled passions with your own heart. You yourself are responsible for what you are, happy or miserable. You yourself make or mar your lives. Still you are busy blaming and finding fault with everybody in the world for your sufferings. You fail to probe within and remove the seed of discontent which is in your mind. You should turn your vision inwards and by watching the workings of your own heart remove the evils lurking there. If you closely examine with the necessary depth of thought all the experiences you have gone through so far in life, you would inevitably come to the conclusion that your environment has not been the cause of the peace or happiness you have enjoyed during certain moments or periods of it. The same environment which appears to have yielded peace at one time appears to have caused dissatisfaction at another and vice versa. Where then lies this subtle seed of discontent? You will admit this poisonous seed is nowhere else but in your own mind. So long as the mind seeks to derive happiness from external sources, from one's possessions, one's achievements, Ramdas can definitely assert from the fullness of experience which God has granted him that it can never know what true and lasting happiness is. It's not our external conditions that are responsible for our misery or happiness, but our own state of mind which must always be kept independent of them. This can be done only by making the mind dwell forever upon God in whom we must take complete refuge. If we pray to Him for sources of worldly happiness, lack of riches, comfort and greatness, or even the prayers of heaven, we ask only for perishable things that inevitably end in pain and care and sorrow for ourselves. We cannot then escape the ever whirling cycle of births and deaths. The highest gift or boon that we have to beg of God to grant us is His grace. Grace gives us jnana which alone can free us from misery. What is the jnana or knowledge that we get by His grace? It's perfect, one-pointed, concentrated devotion to Him and the resulting contentment, peace and bliss in all conditions. If we attain this jnana, then when this body perishes, we directly merge in Him, never to return any more to this world of change, pain and death. That is the goal we have to live for. That is the goal we have to attain. Drive away from your mind the notion that you cannot realize God while living in the world. God whom you seek dwells in the hearts of all creatures and beings. If you ignore this truth and renounce the world, you may be renouncing God Himself. The proper thing to do is to spiritualize all your activities by a complete surrender to the all-pervading Master and Lord of your and the world's being. The question of controlling the mind is one problem which every aspirant has to face. A mind which has been allowed to roam about uncurbed for a long, long time naturally resists control by practice for a short period. A steady and unwavering faith in the supreme power of God who dwells within us and a constant drawing of strength and inspiration from Him 
through remembrance and meditation makes the path of discipline easy for the sadhaka. Believe firmly that by the will and power of the Lord alone, all activities in the world are taking place. Tutor the mind to behold His presence everywhere and in all things. God is at once the unchanging, all-pervading, motionless, formless truth, and also the power active and moving in all the manifestations. He is as the former, the Shiva, and as the latter, the Shakti, both being these, he is also beyond both. This is the complete conception of the Supreme Godhead we have to attain. The end of all sadhana is therefore to realize our oneness with the eternal and immutable Atman and perform all actions in the field of manifestation as the work of the Divine Shakti. Feel always that you are merely an instrument in the hands of Shakti as the first step and do all sadhanas as her work done through you. Do not be impatient, march on steadily and rigorous question of progress and attainment in time to the Lord himself. In fact, when you have thus surrendered everything to the dispensation of the Lord, that instant you will enjoy the supreme bliss of knowledge and freedom. Have no doubts and fears on any account. Perfect peace and contentment in the situation in which God places you is itself self-realization and liberation. You cannot make out a liberated soul from external marks. It's essentially a state of inner calmness, equality, and consciousness of immortality. The ever free Atman is unaffected by actions whatever they be. The notions of good and evil have to be transcended. In the absolute existence, these opposites have no sense and significance. In the universal play of the infinite truth, when the wheel of Shakti works, putting forward an infinite variety of activities to see distinctions of good and evil, a sheer ignorance, and therefore the powers of the immutable touches of pleasure and pain, worldly ties which are ordinary obstacles in the path of spiritual progress can be turned to help you as an incentive for a quicker and easier march. Forget not that the entire universe and its creatures are dependent upon the Lord. He being the sole protector, guide and friend, the burden is ever on him. Yours is to act the part which he has given you and remain ever free and cheerful in all actions which he Shakti causes in you. Be sure that he is guiding you. Make his strength your strength, his will your will, and be his entirely. Behold all forms about you as his forms, that is, your own forms. For you and he are one, and you and all are one. There is none but he, that's yourself. Following are the impressions of Swami Ramdas on the world tour after his return in January 1955. The message spreads. Ramdas had written an article, A Mission of Divine Love, in the vision of August when, by God's will, he was about to depart from India on a world tour. Mother Krishnabai, Swami Sachidananda, Rani Lalita Devi, Sri Sagarlal Gupta 
and run the start from Bombay on 17 August 1954. Going around the world, we visited many countries and returned to the ashram on 2nd January 1955 after four and a half months absence from India. It is great joy to inform the readers of the vision that we were received with hearty welcome from all our friends in these countries. In many respects, this global tour was highly significant. We met a large number of spiritual aspirants and also prominent Christian, Hindu, Sufi, Buddhist, sannyasis, monks, abbots, and priests. Ramda said close communion with these spiritually illumined souls and spent blissful hours with them. Although on the surface there appear to be differences in the religious beliefs of the followers of the great saviors and teachers of the world, Ramda found that there is the same common meeting ground for all of us and that is love and affection based upon the spiritual kinship of our beings. Ramdas contacted people of different countries in this relationship and felt quite free and friendly with them. Indeed, there is no more effective solvent to dissolve all distinctions rising from ignorance than universal love.